Romans 8, 1 through 39 sums up what Christianity is in a nutshell, and is worth reading for a general overview of what Jesus and his disciples taught about salvation and deliverance from sin, which allows people to avoid condemnation and death on Judgment Day. Let's summarize what chapter 8 of Romans is about and walk through what is being said overall. Reading from the NLT translation, Romans chapter 8, verse 1. So now there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. And because you belong to him, the power of the life-giving spirit has freed you from the power of sin that leads to death. The law of Moses was unable to save us because of the weakness of our sinful nature. So God did what the law could not do. He sent his own son in a body like the bodies we sinners have. And in that body, God declared an end to sin's control over us by giving his son as a sacrifice for our sins. He did this so that the just requirement of the law would be fully satisfied for us, who no longer follow our sinful nature, but instead follow the Spirit. Starting at the beginning of the chapter, it says there is no condemnation from God for those who belong to Jesus, that it's because of the power of the Holy Spirit has freed us from our sin nature. The law of Moses wasn't able to solve the craving for sin in our flesh, so God sent Jesus, a sinless human, to die in our place because the laws of God require that sin be punished by death. Jesus took our punishment and made us right with God so that we can receive the Holy Spirit and overcome sin in our own lives. Continuing with verse 5, those who are dominated by the sinful nature think about sinful things, but those who are controlled by the Holy Spirit think about things that please the Spirit. So letting your sinful nature control your mind leads to death, but letting the Spirit control your mind leads to life and peace. For the sinful nature is always hostile to God. It never did obey God's laws, and it never will. That's why those who are still under the control of their sinful nature can never please God. But you who are not controlled by your sinful nature, you are controlled by the Spirit if you have the Spirit of God living in you. And remember, those that do not have the Spirit of Christ living in them do not belong to him at all. And Christ lives within you, so even though your body will die because of sin, the Spirit gives you life, because you have been made right with God. The Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you, and just as God raised Christ Jesus from the dead, he will give life to your mortal bodies by the same spirit living within you. That was Romans 8, 5 through 11. In summary, these verses are saying, people of the world are dominated by their sinful nature, but those who have received God's spirit are empowered to live by God's laws. When people are led by the sin nature, it leads to death, but those who are led by the spirit reap life. Those controlled by their sin nature can never please God because sin nature is hostile to God's ways. Believers are not to be controlled by sin nature because they have the Spirit. Non-believers do not have the Spirit of God, which was promised only to those who believe. So they are not in covenant with God. Even though people's physical bodies will die because of sin, those with God's Spirit will have eternal life, because the Holy Spirit is the same Spirit that raised Christ from the dead and is more powerful than death itself. The Apostle Paul continues, starting at verse 12, Therefore, dear brothers and sisters, you have no obligation to do what your sinful nature urges you to do. For if you live by its dictates, you will die. But if through the power of the Spirit you put to death the deeds of your sinful nature, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. So you have not received a spirit that makes you fearful slaves. Instead, you receive God's Spirit when he adopted you as his own children. Now we call him Abba, Father. For his spirit joins with our spirit to affirm that we are God's children, and since we are his children, we are his heirs. In fact, together with Christ, we are his heirs of God's glory. But if we are to share his glory, we must also share his suffering. That was Romans 8, 12 through 17. So he starts off with therefore, because he's giving his conclusion on what he said previously. Therefore, following the spirit is superior to following the way of the flesh. And because we are not obligated to follow our sinful natures, believers have the power over their carnal desires. If you live by the flesh, you will die in sin. But when you live by the Spirit, you will have the power to put to death your carnal nature. Only those living by God's Spirit are children of God. 
and are joint heirs of the kingdom along with Jesus. It is they who will inherit the blessings that God promises and they will share in Jesus' glory. But they will also share in his persecution and suffering. Continuing, starting at verse 18, Yet what we suffer now is nothing compared to the glory he will reveal to us later. For all creation is waiting eagerly for that future day when God will reveal who his children really are. Against its will, all creation was subjected to God's curse. But with eager hope, the creation looks forward to the day when it will join God's children in glorious freedom from death and decay. For we know that all creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. And we believers also groan, even though we have the Holy Spirit within us as a foretaste of the future glory. We long for our bodies to be released from sin and suffering. We too wait with eager hope for the day when God gives us our full rights as his adopted children, including the new bodies he has promised us. We were given this hope when we were saved. If we already have something, we don't need to hope for it. But if we look forward to something we don't yet have, we must wait patiently and confidently. That was verses 18 through 25. In summary, he is saying, all creation is cursed because of sin, and we should eagerly await the day God restores all of creation to the way it was before corruption and death. God put his Holy Spirit inside of his people, and that is only a taste of this future glory. Currently, all nature is corrupted, even the bodies of the believers. However, in the future, believers will get new sin-free bodies, free from death and decay, and this is how eternal life works. It starts with a resurrection of the dead, that lasts forever because these new bodies are free from death because sin has been removed. Verse 26, and the Holy Spirit helps us in our weaknesses. For example, we don't know what God wants us to pray for, but the Holy Spirit prays for us with groanings that cannot be expressed in words. And the Father who knows all hearts knows what the Spirit is saying. For the Spirit pleads for us believers in harmony with God's own will. And we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purposes for them. For God knew his people in advance, and he chose them to become like his son, so that his son would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And having chosen them, he called them to come to him. And having called them, he gave them right standing with himself. And having given them right standing, he gave them his glory. That was Romans 8, 26 through 30. Here, Paul is reminding us that the children of God are those who have his spirit inside of them. God adopts people as his children. And he says that God called his people as brothers and sisters of Christ ahead of time and put his spirit inside of them. And when God's people pray in the spirit, the Holy Spirit guides them on what to pray for and how to pray so that God's will is done on earth. Then he says that all things work together for the good of those who love God and are called to his purpose. Remember, those who love God are the ones that keep his commands, according to John 14, 15 and 1 John 5, 1 through 3. They are the ones who God knew in advance, who are brothers and sisters of Christ. In Matthew 12, 46 through 50, Jesus says that those who do the will of his father are his brothers and sisters. Romans continue saying that it is the believers whose sins are forgiven and they who are filled with God's glory, not unbelievers. Paul continues in Romans 8.31 saying, What shall we say about such wonderful things as these? If God is for us, who can ever be against us? Since he did not spare even his own son, but gave him up for us all, won't he also give us everything else? Who dares accuse us whom God has chosen for his own? No one, for God himself has given us right standing with himself. Who then will condemn us? No one, for Christ died for us and was raised to life for us, and he is sitting in the place of honor at God's right hand, pleading for us. This was Romans 8, 31 through 34. Here Paul is saying that this is all good news, that God is for his people who are called his children and not against them. God didn't even spare his own son's life to save them, so why would he spare anything else good from his children? No one can stand against them on Judgment Day and accuse them because they are redeemed and forgiven because of what Jesus did. The accuser himself, Satan, can't even stand against them on Judgment Day 
because all of their sins have been put on Jesus. That's his whole point here. Romans 8, verse 35. Can anything ever separate us from Christ's love? Does it mean he no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity or are persecuted or hungry or destitute or in danger or threatened with death? As the scriptures say, for your sake we are killed every day. We are being slaughtered like sheep, as from Psalm 44, 22. Verse 37, no, despite all these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loves us. And I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love, neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither our fears for today nor our worries about tomorrow. Not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky or in the earth below, indeed, nothing in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. In the final verses of the chapter, starting at verse 35, Paul is saying that nothing can separate believers from God's love, not even the hardships and persecutions that we share with Christ or other struggles of life. These things were prophesied to happen to God's people. And he quotes Psalm 44, 22, which says, Yet for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. However, these things aren't a sign of failure in God's love because we have victory over all of it. Paul finishes by saying that neither death nor angels or demons or anything spiritual, natural, or worries of today or cares of tomorrow can separate us from his love as an encouragement to trust in him and the covenant promise that he made to his people. His people are those who have received his spirit, and that is only available to those who believe on Christ Jesus. And by receiving his spirit, they are adopted as God's children, as brothers and sisters of Jesus himself. And we share the inheritance of eternal life that Jesus himself received when he was raised from the dead. The rest of God's children, likewise, will one day also be raised from the dead when Jesus returns. This is the promise of the gospel message and the hope that Jesus taught. The fulfillment of Old Testament prophecies through the Bible, through the people of Israel. This is what the good news is about, and this is why Romans 8 is an excellent chapter to read to get an overview of what it is Christians believe and what it is our God promises. This is Michael Campbell, and I hope you enjoyed this. If you want to hear more, like and subscribe, and I'll talk to you later.